All right. Three, two, one. Let's dance. <laughs> Hello and welcome, everyone. I'm Corey Hofstein, and this is Flirting with Models, the podcast that pulls back the curtain to discover the human factor behind the quantitative strategy. Corey Hofstein is the co-founder and chief investment officer of Newfound Research. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Newfound Research's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinion of Newfound Research. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of Newfound Research may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. For more information, visit thinknewfound.com. This season is sponsored by Simplify ETFs. Simplify seeks to help you modernize your portfolio with its innovative set of options-based strategies. Full disclosure, prior to Simplify sponsoring the season, we had incorporated some of Simplify's ETFs into our ETF model mandates here at Newfound. If you're interested in reading a brief case study about why and how, visit simplify.us slash flirting with models. And stick around after the episode for an ongoing conversation about markets and convexity with the convexity maven himself, Simplify's own Harley Bassman. I guess this episode is Tobias Carlyle, author, podcast host, and founder of Acquirers Funds. Toby joined me in season one where we discussed his background and overall investment philosophy. In this episode, we dive right into the well-documented woes of value investing. Rather than rehash the usual narratives, however, I wanted to get Toby's views as to how this environment is unique. We spend time discussing relative versus absolute cheapness, the potentially arbitrary constraints of value and growth definitions, and whether value can ever be effective for investing in the right tail. In the latter part of the episode, we discuss the two funds Toby manages, including a large cap long short and a small micro long only. We cover performance in 2020, the practical difficulties of shorting, and how investing considerations are unique in the micro cap space. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Tobias Carlisle. Toby Carlisle, welcome back to the show. Excited to have you here. I think the last time... You were on the show. I mean, it was season one, so that's either three or four years ago. I, I can't count very well. My edition isn't great, but I'm I'm super excited to have you here. I know value is sort of a beaten to death story in many people's experience, but I know you're going to bring a, a whole new perspective. So thank you for joining me. Well, thanks very much for having me, Corey. I don't know that I'm going to bring a different perspective. I do think that value's pretty beaten up. I can I can attest to that. Well, maybe maybe if we're lucky. I mean, that value's rebounded quite a bit, but maybe this podcast will really mark the bottom of a of a multi year run, and we can say we were there. But, so, yeah, for sure. Yeah, exactly. Timestamp it. So let's dive in. I mean, as I mentioned, the woes of value have just been well reported. I don't think we need to go over those. But I think one of the most intriguing aspects of value today, to me, is that it's not really cheap on an absolute basis. So when we talk about maybe the spread of valuation versus something like growth, that level's pretty high, but the absolute level of valuation, just when you look at the long-only basket itself, is is still pretty expensive. How does that sort of make this environment unique, and how should that affect how investors are thinking about allocating to value? Well, when, when you say that value is not cheap, what we're talking about is we're looking at any number of different price to fundamental ratios we could be talking about. You know, EV to cash flow, price to sales, price to earnings, price to book. That's what we're talking about, EV, EBIT, EV, EBITDA. And then when we say that it's not cheap, it's about at its long run average. What we're looking at is the price that you're paying relative to those fundamentals. And what we're ignoring in that is any kind of macro backdrop. So you might say, well, the the 10 year got down at the bottom of the crash last year to like 53 bips or something like that. And now it's like 1.6 bips and everybody's asking, is that the reason why value sort of seems to have started working again, that there's, you sort of need to be outside of, of those sort of instruments and maybe moving back into value because you can get a lot more yield in value. So I don't know if that's, I don't know if it's true to say that it's not absolutely cheap. I don't know if it's true to say that's cheap relative to those 
you know, other alternatives like the 10 year or something like that. So it seems to be that there is a pretty big spread between value and alternatives like the 10 year, but it's certainly not cheap relative to its own long run average. But it is cheap again relative to the more expensive side of the market, which is at this sort of historic, you know, I think in many instances, on many of those ratios that I discussed before, it's exceeded the 2000 peak, which is kind of extraordinary to think about because that's when people think back as like the most egregious sort of period of overvaluation, you would think it's 2000, but it's actually, it's today or it's a few months ago. So I don't know that this is a unique period. I think that every every moment in the market feels unique, is unique. It probably rhymes with something else. If I'm being frank, this is probably the most baffled I've ever been in the markets because it feels to me that what's happening in the market indexes, if you look at SPY or something like that, it looks pretty smooth on the surface. It doesn't seem like there's a lot going on. But as we were discussing just before we came on, there are some very powerful undercurrents pushing things around. You can see momentum sort of inverted over the last few months. Value seems to be having a run or there's this sort of view that value is having a run, but I don't know that it's necessarily value. I think that it's some, as we discussed earlier too, it's a small, cheap, junk rally. And I, you know, I have two funds out there. I have Zig, which is long, short, and Deep, which is long, only, small, and micro cap. And so Deep being long, only, small, and micro cap is a huge beneficiary because it catches small and it catches cheap. It's not junk. It's got a very high quality rating. And so I don't think it's outperformed to the extent that it could have if it had had sort of lower quality names in it, funnily enough. But then Zig gets hurt because Zig is long, undervalued quality and short, overvalued junk. And just by virtue of the construction of the portfolio, the longs are a little bit bigger than the shorts are at the moment. So Zig really gets dinged up when the shorts, which are that junky and smaller, they get lifted, whereas my larger, higher quality value names don't sort of catch as much of that. So incredibly kind of frustrating period in the markets and are completely confusing to me as well. So I'll do my best to explain my confusion, but I don't think I'm going to be offering many interesting insights here. One of the things I keep thinking about is the dot-com era is certainly still well within the cultural memory. Right. And we all sort of look back now and go, man, how did people get so caught up investing that way? And it's going to be really interesting to look back 15 years from now on this era and say, no, it really was different this time. And there was something wrong with value and how it was constructed. And we'll, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Or no, we all fell for it again. You know? Well, I think it shows, it just shows how hard it is to be in it. And to recognize what it is, you know, there's that great David Foster Wallace, what is water? And I do think that that's that's true now. It's very hard to stand outside it and say, this is crazy. I've been saying that I think this is a little bit nutty, but I'm the one who kind of looks nutty because I'm saying that at the moment. And I've read accounts of like, I think everybody in the late, I was still in law school in the late 1990s, but you know, it was it was just everywhere. People were day trading back then too. People were getting out of class to go and day trade. All that sort of stuff was going on. I think that everybody knew that this was a mania, but everybody just sort of wanted to be in it and didn't fully expect it to last forever, but sort of knew that it was a knew that it was going on for sure. I think that it took a long time for the mania to come into this market. I, I think that it was sort of overvalued and a bit odd for a few years, but over the last twelve months, you know, retail mania has fully gripped it. And I think you can see it. And when you look at things like, you know, how have the most shorted stocks performed over the last 12 months? They've absolutely skyrocketed, you know, up five or 10 times what they had done over, you know, it's, that's a bad trade. You don't want to be in the most shorted stocks long. You look at the unprofitable tech, same thing. Like that's, that's just a losing trade on average year after year after year, except for 2020 when it's just had this five or 10x stag and that's blown up short funds. You know, you can see it in, you know, GME in particular grabbed a few funds and turned them upside down. You know, GME, I, I don't know the basis for shorting GME because when I looked at GME, GME was in was in the cheap, small positions for me. It didn't ever make it into my fund because my fund, we only started the small and micro portion of that in October, but it, it certainly would have if it had been formed even at the beginning of 2020. 
it's an odd time in markets, but it's hard to sort of stand outside. And I think that's, you know, it's useful. This is sort of why I'm not, I wouldn't describe myself so much as a quant, but it is useful, I think, to stand back and look at the data and say, well, this isn't a, every period is unique, yes, but this is not totally unprecedented. And we can see that the market does have this remarkable mean reverting mechanism in it. Well, let's maybe walk through some of the arguments. I don't want to rehash all of them out there, but I think there are a couple big popular ones that I'd I'd want your opinion on as to why value may be fundamentally broken, pun not intended there. But one that I think about pretty frequently is I was at a conference a couple of years ago in the back of the room getting mic'd up for a panel I was about to go on. And this guy on the panel in front of me, we are talking about the panel was sort of on value and a lot of people were lamenting values under performance and he had done quite well. And he said, well, maybe it's not that value has stopped working. Maybe you're all just measuring value incorrectly, right? The sort of idea that traditional accounting methodologies and ratios are really just too antiquated a means for understanding modern companies. What's your take on that? As you have pointed out in the past, the narrative tends to follow the price action rather than, you know, the other way around, which is what you'd expect. So, you know, as we've discussed, price to book value gets buried as a metric after price to book value has a terrible run and not beforehand. Although there were some people, to be fair, I put them up when I was writing my blog Greenback back in 2008, 2009. I did get something from Goldman Sachs Asset Management where the guy said price to book value as a metric is dead. It's just too crowded. And that was right. So some people did foresee that. True also for size, you know, size was buried, I don't know, 12 to 18 months ago. There's not, and, you know, by good shops who do good work, AQR, I think came out and said there's no statistical basis for size anymore as a factor. And then, you know, lo and behold, it's come back to life. It's roared back with a vengeance over the last, I don't know, 12 months, I guess. So I'm always very careful when I try to fit a story to what's going on because I just think you wind this forward five years and it's going to sound pretty silly. But this would be my take. There are certainly some differences in, you think about tech companies, the way that many tech companies are run is that they don't capitalize improvements to the website and so on. That's all expensed. And so that runs through the P&L rather than being captured on the balance sheet. So that would be why, you know, that might mean that price to book value is a less good metric at measuring something like that. But then on top of that, and so I think the difference is about 15% in aggregate across the whole, across the tech kind of companies. But then you look at what tech companies do, they pay about 15% of their salaries come through in the form of option compensation, which is also not properly captured. It's expensed, but you know, is that the correct way to, to capture it? I don't know. So There are certainly some problems with capturing it. You know, accounting is a very good system, double entry bookkeeping, wonders of the world. It's a very good system for the most part at capturing what is going on. Is it perfect? No. And that's the sort of the job of an analyst is to go through and try and determine the economic reality of what is happening in the business. Look through the accounting, read it and understand it. The reasons why value, I think, has really suffered you know, sometimes it's, I don't think it's necessarily a problem with the tools. It's just sometimes the market favors things that, you know, that we've we've gone through six of these sort of periods since about 1950, where the market prefers very high growth names, sort of more speculative names to names that are generating income right now, generating earnings and cash flow right now. Does that mean that if you're then favoring those companies that if you're I'm a little bit more conservative, I favor income and earning that I can see now. I like to see them buying back stock, lots of other little things like that. Do I then change my methodology because it's just not working now, even though I know that it's worked pretty well over the full set? Or do I say, you know, this too shall pass? And I'm sort of in that I'm in that latter camp. I I'm always updating and trying to see what the data is going to do. But as you have pointed out too in the past, it takes a lot of data to bury a metric. You can't, you know, I think that Cliff Asnes' view that price to book value is not a very good metric is probably right. But if I, you know, the theoretical basis for price to book value as a metric is pretty good. You know, you say, I want to buy the cheapest assets. And the reason I want to look at assets rather than flows is because flows are very volatile or they're, they're more volatile than assets. Assets are pretty static from reporting period to reporting period. 
But then the problem that you run into is there are clearly there are some businesses that are better than other businesses. There are some businesses that don't require any capital in their business at all. And a lot of the tech businesses, they could just about pay it all out. They've got virtually nothing in there. So they've got massive returns on invested capital, like infinite returns on invested capital, basically. And it doesn't have to be a tech business. It's also been true of McDonald's and a few other things that have just bought back and paid out all of their capital. Those are great businesses. Price to book value is going to get that analysis wrong because it doesn't do it properly because it doesn't account for the for the book value properly. So, you know, there's I think there are good arguments for both sides. Cliff says that it's it's a less good metric. And so as value has performed really badly, price to book value has done a little bit better because it's not properly describing value. And so I think that's why you want to be very careful as an investor. If you're whatever style or whatever factor portfolio you sort of identify with, and mine's value and quality together, not just value. If you're massively outperforming your what you think you are, I think you've got to be a little bit careful because you might not actually be what you think you are. You, you might be something else and and you might just hit an air pocket and not perform for a number of years and not know why, not be able to kind of articulate why. So if a guy says he's doing really well when value is doing really badly and identifies as a value investor, maybe he's not a value investor, maybe he's a growth investor, you know, those factors come in and out of favor. It's just the nature of it. So you teed me right up there. I don't know if you meant to, but you teed me up perfectly for where I want to go. Because one of the things I've spent a lot of time thinking about lately are industry conventions that I adopted in my career without really giving much thought as to where they came from. And one of them is this dichotomy between growth and value. Very much, in my opinion, seems to be driven by the style box methodology that was adopted and, and promoted by Morningstar. And what's interesting to me is when you start to constrain and bifurcate the universe and say value investors have to play on the left half, growth investors on the right, it prevents value investors from ever saying a growth stock is trading cheaply, you know, is is perhaps value for itself. And so I guess that would be sort of an, an open-ended question to you. Can growth ever be value? Should we get rid of this sort of growth versus value mentality and allow ourselves if we are value investors to look at when growth is trading cheaply for its own sort of historical basis? So there's a lot in that. And it's a great question. I like the way Cliff tees it up when he, Cliff asks this, when he says, he thinks of it as expensive and and cheap rather than growth and value. But the reason that it's called growth, as I'm sure everybody knows, but it's worth, I always just go back to first principles. Every single time that I do anything, I try to go back and rebuild it from first principles just to make sure that I understand exactly what we're talking about. The idea is that I'm not an efficient markets guy, but it is also true that it's hard to make money in the market. It's that there aren't really very many pockets where there are things that are just obviously mispriced. You know, you have to do some additional work. It's either hidden in the notes. There's some behavioral reason for it. It's just too small to get any kind of capital into it. There are limits to arbitrage, those kinds of ideas. So what we're saying is that basically everything should be priced to deliver roughly the same return over the next 12, three years, 12 months, three years, five years, whatever. Like forward returns should be roughly the same. And so the way that we get to that, when you look at, well, we're paying a lot more for this stock and we're paying a lot relative to its fundamentals and we're paying a lot less for this stock relative to its fundamentals. The way that we bring those two ideas to say that we're still going to earn the same amount out of each is that we expect the fundamentals of the one that we're paying a lot more for to grow a lot faster. And that's how expensive stocks become growth stocks. Kind of value stock, which is, you know, it's a, sometimes we're, we're talking about like definitional things like is a value stock a low price to a fundamental which is sort of value factor investing, even though the factor is literally price to book, but let's say just literally price ratio investing. Can they become growth stocks? Yeah, only if they're really cheap on a fundamental. But if we're talking about, you know, let's talk about the way that a value investor like Warren Buffett does it. He's looking for a company that is at a low valuation relative to where it will be in three or five years time. So what he's saying is that the overall value of the company will grow. Now, how does the value of a company grow? It needs to grow in terms of earnings and it needs to become a bigger company, but it also needs to sustain its return on invested capital because that's how we're saying that something that's trading at a 10% return on equity is about half the value of something that's trading at about a 20% return on equity. So that there's still, it needs to be able to sustain that through that whole period. So 
can a value stock be a growth stock in that context? Yes, it can, because what we're saying is we're paying for three to five years of growth in the value of this company. We're saying, and you can hear Kathy Wood says that I'm a deep value investor because Kathy Wood's saying there's going to be this enormous growth in these companies. So the price that I'm paying today is deep value. We can quibble about you know whether that's true or not, but that's her conception of what she's doing. And I, I don't think there's anything wrong with viewing it that way. The difficulty is that growth is extremely hard to value and to predict, and it seems to disappoint. And I know that the O'Shaughnessy's have done some good research where they show if we bifurcate the market into these two sort of arbitrary buckets of growth and value, and you look at the what the earnings of these companies do and the multiples of these companies do, growth stocks do in fact deliver higher rates of growth in earnings. It's just that the multiple tends to compress over the holding period. So you do tend to find companies that are growing faster than the market in that growthy bucket. And the value bucket is the opposite. The earnings do tend to disappoint, but because the multiple is so dour, the outlook for these companies is so dour, you get the multiple expansion in those. And so they do slightly outperform. So on average, growth stocks tend to slightly underperform because the multiple compression is too great. Growth stocks, it's the other way around. They tend to outperform because they, they no longer compress the multiple expands. The problem with that is you come into a period like we've had over the last five years where growth stocks see the multiple expansion, value stocks see the multiple compression. And that's how you get the big spread that we've seen over the last few years. That's not unique in the market. That's happened about six times for extended periods of time all at famous market peaks and then there's some big crash and we go back into a market that looks better for value. I fully expect that that's what will happen this time. I think that's how it'll be resolved. I don't know when it's going to happen. If you'd asked me five years ago, will it be one year? Will it be soon? I'd have said yes. Ask me now, will it be soon? I'll say yes, but I don't know. It could be another five years. Anecdotally, I've noticed that a lot of people seem to be trying to split the difference between value and growth by adopting this sort of quality at a reasonable price mentality. In prior conversations, you mentioned to me that if you're a value investor and you try to control for things like quality and cash flow, a lot of the returns for traditional sort of value factor investing actually disappear, which I think is pretty interesting. Why do you think this is the case and, and what are the implications for value investors? Well, this is a factor question, right? This is this is solely related to price to book value as the value factor. When you think about what price, to, as I said earlier, I think the theoretical basis for price to book value as a factor is pretty good. You're buying cheap assets that for whatever reason, they're just under earning right now. And you expect that through the business cycle, you're going to get some expansion in their earning power. They're going to do a little bit better as you go along. So the assets will start earning their keep, you know, they'll, so the S and P five hundred, the average return on invested capital, average ROE is about thirteen percent, and so these things are under earning, and as a result, they get a subnormal market multiple. And what you're saying as a value guys, I'm going to buy this thing while it's under earning, because at some point it's going to start doing a little bit better. And we do see there's some very strong statistical evidence for mean reversion in there. When you actually look at the portfolios that you construct using price to book value as a ratio. You're not getting $100 million of assets trading at $10 million. What you're getting is a billion dollars of assets with $900 million of debt. So you've got $100 million of equity, and then you're buying those for $10 million. So what you're actually doing is you're taking a big bet on the, the this company paying down its debt, basically getting out of distress. That's what you're backing. When you try to control for, th and sensibly then you would think, well, what I'm going to go and do is I'm going to control for the quality of this business and its ability to repay and all of those sort of things. The moment that you do that, you kind of eliminate the return. This sort of statistical outperformance of price to book value goes away. And so the only way that I can kind of resolve what is actually happening is many of these companies, are, the market is looking at them and saying, there is this existential risk that this thing slips into bankruptcy. And what you're getting when you're holding these things is you're saying, I've, I've got some divergent view that these things aren't going to slip into bankruptcy or across, across the portfolio of these things. Enough of them are going to survive to make me money. And so I'm going to put together a portfolio. So what you're actually doing is you're sort of, you're a grave dancer right on the edge and you're hoping that a lot of these recover. 
And then I think if you control for quality and you try to, you know, you look to see if they will in fact recover, what you're doing is you're actually moving yourself away from those things that are right on the edge to things that everybody else agrees this thing's not going to slip into bankruptcy. And so that has kind of gone away. And so you don't get the risk-based performance, the risk-based reward that the guys who are right on the edge get. So I don't think that as a factor, when you control for those things, it doesn't work. Having said that, quality as a standalone factor, that clearly works really well. And this is looking for very good quality things. And then I think if you're, you know, if you're a value guy, so I'm a, I'm a quant value guy in a sense that I like looking at the research and seeing what has worked. And I also believe that there are very strong behavioral reasons for thinking beforehand how you're going to construct a portfolio, keeping your position sizes to a certain size, rebalancing regularly. Because I just think there are a million ways that you can blow yourself up as an investor. And really, the name of the game is just to survive for as long as you possibly can until you get your little runs and your little eddies, the tide turns in your favor, and then you have a good run for a period of time. So I'm not trying to construct a – I'm not backtesting to see if I can generate massive outperformance in a backtest. What I'm doing is I'm thinking as a value guy, what do I want in a portfolio? I want cash flows. I want – to pay not much for those cash flows. I want pretty good returns, pretty good profitability. I want to see management doing something with that profitability, buying back stock if it's undervalued. That sends a very powerful message that free cash flow is real. Management's doing the right thing. They think it's undervalued too. Lots of good messages in that. So that sort of tends to push my portfolio into the quality factor as well. You know, that's sort of accidental. It's not, I'm not trying to be a quality investor. I'm trying to be a good value investor. And that definitely, I think that adds return over the long haul to do those things, to look for those kind of things. But, you know, not in a price to book type world. It doesn't help price to book, but it does help as a value investor, as sort of a a quality value investor, I guess. I think it does help returns over the very long haul. But, you know, they go through periods like today where it's small, cheap junk. It's not helping me. Yeah, that mental imagery of of dancing on graves very much juxtaposes for me the perhaps what I'll call optimistic enthusiasm of disruptive innovation growth investors. And it, it calls into question for me, is value investing fundamentally incongruous with right tail investing? Like investing for those big, you know, disruptive concepts that can totally change the earnings of a company? So value does get its its wins. But when you let's go back to that sort of arbitrary bifurcation of growth and value. Why do people let's assume that people who are investing in in the market are fully aware of what they're doing when they're constructing portfolios? Why do you invest in the growth bucket when you know that the growth bucket the expensive bucket slightly underperforms because all of the best performers, all of the best single name returns, uh, all of the lottery tickets are found in the growth portfolio. There are things that just never get cheap because they're just too good. Amazon really never gets cheap. You know, for a long time, Microsoft never really got cheap. All of the, all of the monster winners and probably Shopify as an example now, like Shopify, I don't think will ever get cheap. Shopify will always be expensive because it's such a great business. It's going to grow for a very long period of time at a very high rate. They never get cheap. That's why people hunt in that bucket looking for those sort of monster winners that will run for years and years and years. Value doesn't tend to get those sort of monster winners, although value does get really good returns over a longer period of time by buying those things when they buying the things that are very good that do come down into that bucket because there's some sort of period of underperformance. But typically, the, the big hits for value are things that it looks like it's going out the door. They have some turnaround in place and all of a sudden, it's a different business and it looks great again. And I'd include Microsoft. I know I raised it before. For a long time, Microsoft was sort of invincible. But then in like the mid-2000s, 2010, 11, 12, there was this period of time where the stock had gone nowhere since 99, where it dropped super, super expensive. And then Bill Gates retired, Steve Barmer ran it for some time, and it had its first year of revenue not growing in sort of 2011, 12, something like that. And people looked at it and said, maybe it's over for Microsoft. It can't sort of, it was still a pretty good return on invested capital. I think it got to like a free cash flow yield of like 11%. 
which seems crazy. And then you had Satya Nadella coming in and people said, well, he's a new guy. We don't know what he's going to do. Little do we know if we wind forward 10 years that it would become this tech software as a service compounder staple. So that was a value stock that did become one. And I think that the way that you achieve those right tail returns as an investor, I think that you know Warren Buffett figured this out a long time ago. Really, the way that you do it is you have to hold for a long period of time. And I've done these tests now. I had to rebuild my system so I could do this. But basically, I can look at a holding. I can form a portfolio and then just look at that portfolio over the full data set that I have. And what you find is that in the portfolio, so the predictive power of a portfolio is about five years. Beyond about five years, there's nothing. And the only thing that I've found really that is predictive is value. Everything else sort of seems to the excess returns disappear pretty quickly. Momentum excess returns disappear pretty quickly. Quality and value together sort of seem to be quite predictive over an extended period of time. But even then, there's a lot of luck in these portfolios. You form a 30-stock portfolio, you get plenty of zeros in that portfolio. And these are quality stocks. You, you, know, you look at them, they've got great returns and invested capital, lots of cash, lots of cash flow. That thing ends up being a donut over like a decade or 15 years. But in that portfolio, you get these absolutely monster returners. And so Microsoft is one from that. You know, Microsoft gets picked up on multiple occasions through 2010, 11, 12, 13, I think might have been its latest. And, and there are lots of these companies that come in. And so the way you capture these right tail returns, I think, is you have to hold them for an extended period of time as they sort of transition into high growth, high quality compounder type stocks. And I think that's kind of luck. You know, you get a portfolio, you hold enough, some of them are going to be donuts, but some of them are going to outperform so massively that it's not going to matter. And your performance then, maybe you're more like a VC where, you know, VCs famously have one out of 10 positions, they have one or two big hits, one or two donuts, the rest in the middle sort of deliver a market performance. And then there's a lot of luck in that. I don't know how predictive it is, but I do think that that's how you capture the right tail. I've gone through and looked at those portfolios, like just for fun, form a portfolio of 30 stocks without knowing what happens afterwards, which of these are the ones that I prefer. It's impossible to predict which ones are going to do it and which ones aren't. Like All of the rules that Buffett applies, they don't really work. He's doing something that he... I'm not saying that he's lying about what he's doing. I'm just saying that he's not necessarily... Maybe he's not even able to articulate exactly what he's doing, how he's figuring out which of these are going to be the big performers. But that's how I think you do it. You've got to get a little bit lucky. As you alluded to a little bit earlier, the evidence for speculative froth in 2021 seems to be everywhere. But if we look towards history, like the dot-com era, I mean, the path to calling a top is just absolutely littered with graves. So if you're a value investor today, how do you protect yourself from another three to five years of, of this type of market environment? Well, again, I always try to go back to first principles and think about what I'm doing. And then I think about what my objective is in this market. So what I'm doing when I'm buying stocks I think that there's there's three sources of return. There's the yield that you're getting. That's what the company's paying out in dividends or buybacks. There's the portion of the the earnings that are reinvested for growth. And then that, you know, you assume that you get some roughly the same return on invested capital and maybe it sort of mean reverts back to an average return on invested capital over over a few years. But you do get this period of of perhaps super earning as it's reinvested. So you got yield, you got growth. And then I would have said, when I wrote Deep Value, I would have said you can just about bank on mean reversion too. But I think that that's still true, but over very long periods of time. So five years may not be enough time. It may continue to, to widen over a period like five years. So I'm very comfortable buying the portfolios that I'm buying. I can see the return stream that I'm going to get out of them. There may be some multiple compression, further multiple compression, but I don't really mind as long as the company. So one of the things that I like is buying back stock. A company that gets cheap and buys back stock, you know, that's from my perspective, that's an ideal outcome. It can stay cheap for a really, really long period of time. And it just, my holding in it is increasing in value, even if it's not necessarily reflected in the stock price. If I'm getting some yield along with it, I'm going to be doing okay. 
value hasn't actually done that badly. You know, up to 2018, value had been doing quite well. It's been roughly delivering its long-term returns. It's just that the market had been doing much better and growth stocks have been doing even better still. Since 2018, it's been a different story. It's been sort of under-earning because it's really seen that multiple compression. So I'm, I'm reasonably comfortable that the portfolios will either get better value or that we'll see that mean reversion reflected in it. I don't know how long it's going to take. I can sort of survive for a long period of time waiting for it to happen. Whether investors can do that too, you know, that's the really difficult question. It's the, the old assets and liabilities mismatch. The assets are solid, but the liabilities, you know, they tend to flow in and out. I sort of think that the argument for value is so compelling at this point in the cycle that it's hard to see how somebody would want to bet somewhere else. But, you know, if you're looking at the track record, I can completely understand how you would do that. But I think that value, you know, looks about as good as it ever looks right now. One of the really interesting sort of historical anecdotes to me is when you look at the dot-com era, value worked as such, or at least it seems to have worked as such a great defensive factor because a lot of quality names had been sold off. Sort of as we got further into the right tail, people had to fund purchasing all these high speculative names, high growth names by selling off their quality names, and it pushed quality into value. And so when the bubble popped, value investors were in these very high quality names. That doesn't seem to be as much the case today, or at least yet. Quality seems to still be leaning very heavily into the growth or more expensive side of the equation. How do you think about navigating this? How do you think about the behavior of value when it's junkier versus when it's higher quality? Well, that, that analysis, I think that comes from the, the AQR. There was an AQR paper that came out or a Cliff paper that came out in the last quarter of Q3 or Q4 last year. Maybe I'm a year out from that. I'm not entirely sure I forget. But basically, they looked at return on assets and a few other kind of quality metrics of the value decile or the value portfolio and running it back to sort of maybe 25 years, maybe something like that. And it was pretty clear that ordinarily what you're doing when you're a value guy is you're, you're getting a slightly worse portfolio at a much bigger discount. And so you're kind of a handicapper. You're saying, yeah, this is a worse portfolio, but the companies in this portfolio have worse characteristics. They don't earn as much on assets. They don't have the same cash flow conversion, whatever. The, they don't have the same growth, whatever the thing is. But I'm getting such a big discount that my portfolio is still better than a growth portfolio because they are better companies, but you're paying so much more. They just can't catch up over the holding period. In 99, 2000, they actually became such high quality. They were, the return on assets of the value portfolio was better than the return on assets of the growth portfolio. And it was clear that they were going to do exceptionally well over that you know, the next few years, maybe not clear to the market because it, it seemed to catch the market as a surprise because the market went backwards for two or three years while value sort of rocketed. And I think that that's where a lot of people got this idea that value is defensive and that value will protect you in a drawdown. I still think that to some extent that is true. So if you look at, you know, the most expensive stocks at the moment are so expensive and value stocks are sort of roughly where they are at their long run mean, it's hard for me to see how value you know, why value would draw down more than they would sort of to get back to parity, the, the expensive stuff's going to have to draw down a lot more than the value stuff is. So I sort of think that in the next go round, value will be a little bit more defensive. But the thing that you run into is that nobody sells because they want to sell. They sort of panic sell or they have to sell because they've got a margin call or, you know, they're trying to fund something else. So they're selling to buy into something else. So I, I don't think that the kind of character of the companies really comes into much consideration when that happens. Although I do think that a lot of the expensive stuff will, some of these companies can come back 80 or 90% and still be expensive. You know, I think Tesla can come back. I mean, Tesla's come back a lot now. I think it's come back 20% or something like that, but Tesla could still come back 80% and still be an expensive stock. So I think that something like Tesla will and there are, Tesla's not even the most egregious example. There are lots of companies like that. I don't think that value is necessarily going to protect people in the next go-around. Although 
I would say this, that when you look at the value portfolios that, or the portfolios that I try to put together, they tend to have a lot more cash on the balance sheet. So to the extent that you know, the EV moves like beta, you know, they should have some protection by virtue of the fact that they're carrying cash, by virtue of the fact that they're buying back stock. You know, in the in the extreme move, like a March 2020 moves, that none of that is relevant. Nobody's looking at what the fundamentals of the business are. They're just sort of selling willy nilly. If that happens, then you know, all bets are off. Everything gets sold at the same rate. So I don't think that value is protective in that sense. But I do think that if you know what you hold, if you understand the value proposition of the business that you hold, and it gets sold down, it's harder to panic because you just say, "Well, this is a this is an extraordinarily good bargain at this price." I think one of the big misperceptions that I hear out there is that, well, value investors are just sort of stubbornly sitting on their hands and refusing to change their systems. I know from talking with you that that is definitively not the case. You've got a research graveyard that is just littered with different ideas around fixing value or exploring value from different angles. So hoping you could maybe share some of the innovations you've explored over the past and those that just really haven't worked out. Yeah, I, the thing about being sort of quanty and testing a lot of stuff is that I don't know how much of it is an innovation. Anybody who's got access to any of those big databases has thrashed them to the point that you know they've found every meaningful or not meaningful relationship in those databases this is what I have tried to do. I've tried to create something that does as well as the market over this period of time where the market runs a bit harder. And you would just naturally think about the things that you would expect that would work. It would be very high growth rates in revenues or earnings or cash flow or those sort of things. It tends to be less the, re- the earnings and the cash flow because they don't tend to have a lot of that. It just tends to be very high growth rates in revenue. The problem that you run into is that that over the full set, it underperforms. And so this has been the, the real challenge that I have had is that everything that I can find that works in a period like this underperforms through the full set. The, really, the only thing that I think helps is that, you know, we were sort of talking about a little before in that right tail discussion. If you buy something for value and then hold on to it where it runs into, for whatever reason, it just becomes the more glamorous part of the market and it runs with glamour. That's sort of the only way that I can see. And so that's probably the only innovation I have found, not innovation, but the only thing that I have found that seems to help you keep up with the market is this idea of never sell, which has kind of been percolating through the Fintwit guys. I got to say it actually, it's the only thing that I really do think works where if your view is what I'm going to do is set out to buy portfolios and I'm just never going to sell. And so that means I'm going to get stuff in there that it's going to be up five times and then it's going to be a donut over my holding period. And I'm totally okay with that. I can come to terms with that sort of psychologically having all of that and not selling it at that time. Because I think the way we fool ourselves is that we're going to pick the tops or the bottoms. Nobody is able to do that because we're already saying this is irrational. You know, It's irrational. It's undervalued here. That's an irrational idea. It's mispriced. It's overvalued here. That's also an irrational idea. The way that I think that you sort of can keep up with the market is to do something like what Buffett has done, although he's not getting the credit for it at the moment because the rest of the portfolio seems to be dragging him down. But he's holding on to things for very long periods of time that do become – so Apple's an example, but then that's a very short holding period too. He deployed $50 billion into it and 18 months later it was up three times. So that's a good trade. If you can do those every now and again, you, you'll do fine in the market. Hard to predict prospectively. So I would say that this is the, the kind of the thing that drives me nuts is that the stuff that I can find that works in this market just performs so woefully over the full set. The one kind of interesting thing that I have been looking at is Partha Mahanran, who's this Canadian academic. He has this idea of the G score, which is like the F score, which is the Piotrowski F score, except he applies it to the growth names. So he explicitly looks at only the most expensive names. And then he says, within this group, we are going to have these lottery ticket performers, which are going to be few. And we know that the very vast majority of these things are probably going to underperform the market. So he's got this G score, which is like a version of the F score. He hunts in that very expensive part of the market. And the funny thing is that most of the time, his performance, the G score's performance is driven on the short side. 
because it it's sort of it's finding stuff that's going to underperform the market. But through these last five years, he says that the performance has been driven on the long side. So perhaps that's the that's an interesting kind of counterweight to a value portfolio where you're explicitly hunting in the most expensive stuff, which you'd ordinarily be short. And then you're running this analysis in there where you're looking for, basically you're looking for shorts. But you know that if you go through a, a period where the market gets very frothy, then perhaps the longs will sort of help you through that period. So that strategy has been one of the best performed strategies over the last few years from the long side where ordinarily it's driven from the short side. So I know you actually spoke to Partha on your podcast. I think it was a little over a year ago. You run a very popular podcast called The Acquirer's Podcast, one of my favorites to listen to. And I'm curious, how has your experience as a host shaped or helped reshape your own investment philosophy and, and practice? Yeah, it's been it's been an unexpectedly positive thing to do. I, I started out initially doing it because I wanted to promote the funds and you have compliance obstacles to promoting the funds. So my solution was I'll promote the firm, I'll promote myself. And if folks get interested in what I'm doing, they'll explore that and then they'll find the funds that I'm I'm promoting. But I found that it's good discipline to sit down for an hour a week, which is about all, all the interviews take, and to talk to someone who's got some expertise in an area that I'm interested in and to sort of explore the way that they think about it. I'm sure you get the same benefit from talking to other people on this podcast. A lot of it is, and you get to drive the conversation so you get the same benefit that I have where I get to, I'm interested in stuff like that. So I heard from some other friends of mine, Justin Carboner and practical quant Jack Forehand at Validia. They told me that, and I've interviewed both of them on the podcast. They told me that Partha had the the G score had been the best performed one, and I just talked about it on the podcast. And Partha came into the comments on the YouTube channel and said, "You know, thanks for highlighting the research or something like that." So I reached out to him directly, and then that's how he came to have the conversation. It turns out, you know, he's a fascinating guy. He's a professor of accounting at a Canadian university, and he's I think his degrees from Harvard or something like that. He's super smart, you know, really nice guy. And then we talked about exactly the, the G score because it's, it's such a foreign, not a foreign idea. It's a totally, you know, it's totally analogous to the F score, totally understandable. But it's unusual to find a guy who's focusing exclusively on the most expensive stocks. You know, it just doesn't, you know, my DNA, that just doesn't work for my DNA to think in, in those terms. So, but, you know, uh, it's then I would never have realized that the returns are driven from the short side if he hadn't sort of highlighted that to me. And then the fact that there's been this little change in the market over the last few years where they've been driven from the long side, it surprised him as much as it surprised anybody. So that was, that's a good example of how I've learned something talking to these guys. And so I've, I make it a habit to talk to, I talk to academics, I talk to practitioners, I talk to value guys who run small shops, I talk to special situations guys to try to find ideas that I can reincorporate into my own process. I'm not sure, you know, just by virtue of the fact I've been doing this for a long time. I've tested a lot of stuff. I've thought about a lot of stuff. And the, it is difficult. In the markets, a lot of stuff is counterintuitive. You know, like you would expect that high growth in revenues probably leads to pretty good returns, right? And it's just that's just not the case. It's just categorically not the case over a full data set. Anybody can run a simple back test and show that. So that's one of those, you know, if you're new to the markets, it sort of seems bizarre that that would be the case but that's certainly the case and then you have this other problem too in the markets where they're always changing so we know that you know the size factor was buried about 12 or 18 months ago and here it is the zombies come back to life you know price to book value is buried but then price to book value does better through a period where value doesn't do very well by virtue of the fact that it doesn't describe value very well so that the market is tough and i i think it's good to talk to other guys and just just to hear what they're saying about what's happening it's been a very useful experience for me and it forces that sort of hour of discussion, thinking deeply about their process. And then, you know, it, you, I'm throwing that into contrast with my own process while I'm doing it. So it's, it's been an incredible experience. And then it gives you this network too of people who see it like Partha did reach out and want to chat. So it's been a wholly positive experience for me. One of the things I want to make sure we spend a little bit of time on is your process. And I know 
I think it was right after our last podcast, you launched the Acquirers Fund, ticker ZIG. And I know you can't talk about it on your podcast, but this is my podcast. So we're going to talk about it. And I know like a lot of value funds, it, it struggled, I think, more than most people expected in Q1 and Q2 2020. But then really what was interesting to me and probably not fun for you to talk about is a lot of the value peers accelerated in Q4 2020 and Zig really didn't. And I was hoping you could sort of walk me through where the sort of the meaningful deviations from maybe more traditional long only value funds came from in that period. Yeah. So that was driven by the short. So what I have two funds. I have Zig, which is long, short, mid cap, large cap. And then I have deep, which is long only, small and micro. It's, and I, it's silly to try to short in small and micro cap stocks. Just you know, GameStop as an example of, of why you don't do that. But it's still diabolically difficult shorting in mid and large cap stocks. And it's become increasingly difficult over the years as there's no rebate on the previously you got the cash from the short. You get whatever, 4 or 5 or 6% on that. So you're getting some earning. Now you don't get anything on it. And you know you're fighting with the, the most overvalued stuff, or the wor- the best shorts are always very crowded because it's you know everybody knows that they're great shorts. Tesla's another example of that, and Tesla's had this. I think a lot of what Tesla's performance is by virtue of the fact that it's very heavily shorted, and it's got a small float. So there's a lot of delicacy when you're trying to be short these names. And so, like I think I said at the start of the podcast, that the Zig's portfolio. It tends to be value quality in a mid and large universe. And so the long portfolio is is value and quality. And the short portfolio is, you know, overvaluation, extreme overvaluation to the extent that I can come up with a value for these things, which typically I can't because they're they're losing so much money and they they have this carrying so much debt. It's just impossible to kind of come up with some sort of value for them. The problem for Zig in Q4 was that, so it's 100% long and it's 30% short. And the part of the, the way that it generates return is that there's a spread bit in there and there's a long only, you can think of it being 70% long value and 30% long short, the spread. So the spread closed up a little bit for value, but the problem that it is, the problem that for Zig was that the run in the market wasn't so much value as it was this small cheap junk run and as i said earlier the portfolio tends to be long value and quality and short sort of junk and uh, the shorts just for that particular period just tended to be a little bit smaller than the longs and so they got lifted and it sort of got squashed got caught in between the two i think in the long run typically the spread closes and value quality slightly outperforms so i'm i feel good that it generates returns over the long run I feel really good if the market goes into some sort of breakdown because in that scenario, it should do very well. So I think that I'm sort of trying to be forward looking about the construction of these portfolios. I always think that the future for something like this looks very good. I get a little bit nervous about deep because it's sort of had this, it's had a phenomenal run and the value guy in me gets nervous whenever I get that really good run like that because I can see that run breaking down. But I do think that Small has been so beaten up for so long that run has got years and years and years left in it for for small over the market. For the long short value, I think that it's, you know, when the market falls over, and I don't know when that happens, but I would much rather be in something that's got that hedge on. And so I, I think at some stage that happens and the hedge will be very helpful in that in that scenario. One of the things I find intriguing about that long short is sort of to go back to what we said very early in the podcast is long only value is not particularly cheap from an absolute basis, but the spread between value and growth or or cheap and expensive is still at historical high. So it does give you some of that ability to capture that spread as it potentially comes in. But I do know that Right, there's a very big difference between shorting academically and, and shorting practically. And, and you mentioned some of that, and you mentioned some of the difficulties of your shorts might tilt to having a little bit of a size bias or a junk bias, which has come against you. 
I'm curious as to how you think about shorting a little bit more from a practical perspective, right? The dangers of shorting have been front and center in 2021. How do you think about managing shorting risk, which is very different than the risks on the long side of the book? We do a number of things to try to reduce the the risk of shorting. And the first one is you just don't want to be short the most heavily shorted stocks because you you become captive to what the other shorts are doing in that instance. And Tesla is a great example of that. GameStop's a great example of that. You've got (laughs) Wall Street vets out there actively hunting for these crowded shorts with low float. And so, you know, I'm sort of surprised that people get caught in that because it's most shorts know that you don't want to be in heavily crowded shorts with a low float. So most people are, are trying to avoid that sort of stuff. And GME in particular was a funny one because it was, I thought that, you know, GME had been deep value. It had been in deep value screens. Michael Burry was long GME. I'd get very nervous if I'm on the other side of a trade from Michael Burry. And not, not to say that, you know, he's right all the time or anything like that. I just think that in particular, if there's anybody who's drilled down and understood a situation, it's Michael Burry. So you want to be careful trading on the other side of him. But I trade on the other side of, you know, there's always a super investor on your side and on the other side of any position that you put on. So you can't be too kind of worried about that. And it certainly wouldn't really factor into my my thinking. But the shorting in particular, we're protected by the fact that we, we keep the cash balance against the shorts. If they get too, we just rebalance out and if they go against us. So we're always taking down the size of the shorts. This is the thing about shorting. You know, if it goes against you, the problem gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Whereas for a long... You know, you're 100% wrong on a long. You just don't get out of bed in the morning. Eventually, it goes to zero. You don't really have to do anything to sort of survive. Whereas with a short, at some stage, you've got to grasp the nettle. You know, you've got to fix it up. So what what we tend to do is we take down the size of the shorts at a rebalanced state. So if it goes against us, we take it down. It goes against us, we take it down. Eventually, the idea is that it goes with us or we're wrong, in which case we just close it out. So you don't want to be short the heavily, the most heavily shorted names. I also look at this, I try to apply a momentum overlay, and that was a more recent thing over the last, I forget how long it is now, but four or five years, because the shorts, you know, if you're thinking about the junkiest stuff that you want to be short, and I'm shorting stuff that's got not so much on valuation, it's short because it's got financial distress, it's short because it's got statistical earnings manipulation or statistical fraud, and in addition to that, it's got no earnings, it's got negative cash flow. It's got a whole lot of debt. At some stage, it's going to have to refinance. It's going to raise more debt or it's going to sell some equity. While the markets support them selling equity, they can really keep that show going on for a very long period of time. And some of them, it seems, can get to escape velocity. It looks like Netflix got to escape velocity. It doesn't need to go to the markets anymore, even though it's carrying a lot of debt. Tesla, maybe it gets to escape velocity. I don't know. I don't think so. But I think that that basket of you know kind of junky fundamentals isn't enough you need to find things that have got negative momentum too or just bad momentum and so again that's something that does introduce this additional risk in the portfolio so every time you solve for something you, you're kind of introducing another risk and the risk is that you run into a period where negative where momentum kind of inverts which is what happened as well in the last quarter of 2020 that and I, I think that Michael Green is right on this not being so much a value run as it is sort of a negative momentum run. And I don't know why that's happening in the market. I don't know what's driving that. I don't know if that's some big shop trying to close up its shorts or everybody has sort of been closing up their shorts. I think that the Wall Street bets, you know, riot or vandalism or whatever it is sort of scared a lot of guys into closing up their shorts. And so I think we've seen that happen. You know, I know that Bill Ackman came out and said they don't have any shorts on. They've taken them all off. I kind of like that idea now. All of a sudden, I'm one of the few people who's got their shorts on still in this market. And I kind of feel like that's the thing that, you know, that's the event that makes that all turn around and run the other way. I don't know if it necessarily does, but I like the fact that the spread is extremely wide. We've got the shorts on and we've survived through this period of time. If it turns around and goes the other way, then the performance turns around and goes the other way too. Talk to me a little bit about what you're doing in the micro and small cap space. I know it was either Q3 or Q4, you you launched the Acquires Deep Value Index, which is now being tracked by the ETF Deep. How does looking in that space differ from the mid and large cap? What do you have to do differently, think about differently? They just tend to be smaller companies. Well, mid and large cap, it tends to be professional managers who've been 
in the markets for a long time. You've also got lots of private equity and activist hunting. So anytime they they get they never really get too far away from intrinsic value without somebody stepping in to try to push them back in. Small and micro is really kind of as close as it gets to frontier investing for for this stuff because there are there's a lot of wacky characters out there. There are guys who've got you know suboptimal kind of holdings in their business or the way that they hold their shares because they're just interested in control. It's run by the owner operator. In many cases, that's good. You do have to be careful though. There are some guys who are, you know, they make all of their money off the shareholders rather than with the shareholders. So the way that I get around that is we try to, I, there are a hundred positions in the small and micro fund. We're looking for smaller holdings so that if any given management team is a bad actor or any given company doesn't perform the way it should, it's not going to impact the portfolio. It's long only, so we don't shorten small and micro stuff. The stuff that we're hunting for, though, is exactly the same philosophy as the mid and large cap in the sense that they're undervalued. They've got tend to be more cash-rich balance sheets. They tend to be cash flowing and they're buying back stock. And so I think if you, you, know, if you go into Morningstar and you look at that portfolio tab where it shows you the aggregated portfolio statistics of the fund versus the index. And you can do this for zig or deep on every metric. The portfolios, the funds, zig and deep are both better than the market. The only one where the only one where that's not the case is the expected growth in zig, in the zig portfolio. And anybody who's done any testing will tell you that those forward metrics just don't work. They're always overly optimistic. And so what I think that the market is just analysts are just over optimistic about the index's prospects and insufficiently optimistic or pe- too pessimistic about those companies that are in the fund and the, and that's why they that's why they're cheap that's why they're undervalued because they their forward returns are expected to be so small but if you look at the the historical earnings rates are huge the historical growth rates are huge and they're much bigger than the market so even if they come in a little bit, they're still going to be growing much faster. They're still generating positive cash flow. They're still using it to buy back stock. You're concentrating your value. Over time, it should work. And it sort of seems to be working now in deep. I think that Zig's time is is very close at hand. One of the things I've been keeping my eye on in that small cap space is because you have had this huge junk run, the composition of your vanilla small cap index has changed dramatically, especially at the top of the scale. You start to look at total leverage ratios of the index. There's just way more junk that is frothed up to the top, which might argue for playing smaller cap right now with a value or quality tilt to make sure you're not overweighting those names that have just run up because a lot of these companies have been blown out of their shorts or for any other number of variety of reasons that this sort of composition change has happened. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's, I think that if there's really a part of the world where quality works really well, it's small and micro cap because the indexes are so poorly constructed. I mean, all of those, in, those value indexes are totally misnamed because they tend to be, they're explicitly looking for low on a price to book value basis. And they have some other odd metrics in there bad momentum, you know, other stuff in there that's not value either. And because they need to be roughly market cap, you know, the growth portfolios have to be roughly the same market cap as the value portfolios. The growth portfolios are much smaller than the value portfolios are huge. And what we're doing is we're not, we don't have approaches anything like that. We're trying to find the best in the, in the case of Zig, we're finding 30 names that are undervalued, strong cash flows, buying back stock. And small and micro is 100 names. And I think it's really easy to put together. Like I, I, I'm sometimes just sort of shocked at the quality of the portfolios that we can get hunting like that. It's amazing how bad the performance of small and micro has been for like a decade, given that the portfolio quality hasn't been that bad. And I think when you look at individual investors who are good small and micro cap investors, so Ian Castle, all those sort of guys, they've done really, really well against a backdrop that is terrible because it is kind of easy to find these undervalued gems in there. And so I think that Deep deep is a beneficiary of that. I think it's very easy to find some astonishingly good names. I'm always a little bit nervous about management teams are sort of a little bit untested because they tend to be newer. They tend to be owner operators, which, you know, that's a double-edged sword. In many cases, that's a good thing because their incentives are aligned. In other cases, they just don't have that sort of experience of running a public company for an extended period of time. They're not aware of all the levers you can pull as a public company CEO, buy back your stock if it's cheap. 
you know, divest stuff that's not working that well, all those sort of things that more professional managers in mid and large caps, certainly they're just, they're thinking about that stuff all the time. But I do, I like the prospects for both of those things. I like the prospects for small and micro and I like the prospects for, for value and the spread. Now, I know that you are the author of several well-known books on value investing right now, including Quantitative Value with our friend Wes Gray, Deep Value, The Acquirer's Multiple. But I know you're actually working on a new one titled The Invincible Industrialist. I think I got that right. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> All right. Give me the basics and what's inspiring you to write right now. The run in value has been so bad, I've turned to philosophy. That's how you know it's got really, really bad. So what I did, I looked at... I've spoken about Buffett a few times. He's clearly an inspiration for me. When you look at what he has achieved, he's 90-something years old. He's the majority owner of the company that he's been running since the 60s. And he's, he still gets to make the decisions every day when he wakes up. Nobody can kick him out. He decides when he goes. And I thought, isn't that a great way to have lived your life, that you get to do what you love your entire life and there's no danger of being kicked out. He's got this great line where he says, I wake up every morning and I have a look in the mirror and then everybody who's going to have their say for the day has had their say. Like <laughs> Buffett gets to decide what Buffett gets to do. And I thought, what are the properties that allow him to do that? And I just at the time, like I've, I've tried to read Sun Tzu's Art of War maybe half a dozen times since I was in high school. And I come back to it maybe every five years or so and, and it's just impenetrable, it makes no sense to me. And I had this experience, maybe it was the, like the pandemic or quarantined or I don't know, maybe just getting an appreciation for what Buffett was doing. And I thought, you know, I'm slightly approaching this problem from the wrong perspective. And sometimes it's like I turned 40 a year or so, okay, coming up on two years now. Maybe it's an age thing as well. But you, I just had this, I just had this, you know, when you're young, what you're trying to do is generate the highest returns you can possibly re- generate and you think that that's how you're going to achieve you know everything that you want to achieve and i think as as i get older i'm more interested in staying in this game i really love what i'm doing i really want to be doing this for a very long period of time i hope i still want to be doing it when i'm 90 years old i hope i get to 90 years old i hope i still want to be doing it then if all of those things are going well and i still want to be doing it then how would i get from here to there and so I went back and I looked at books like Sun. So all of a sudden, Art of War sort of made a little bit of sense to me for the first time. I had this like a little epiphany where I was like, I can see some connections between what Buffett does. And I think there's this sort of misconception about the Art of War that it is, you know, they talk about, and this is the philosophers have talked about this too. So Machiavelli and Sun Tzu are sort of names that you don't mention in polite company because they sort of, they talk about it as using practical methods rather than sort of moral or ideological methods. And when you, when you say practical, what you mean is brutal or deceptive, you know, cunning, wily. And then if you go back and you look at, you know, philosophers have tried to square that circle for a long time. When is it appropriate to use cunning? When is it appropriate to use honor? They say, you know, should you fight in the, in the lion's fur or the lion's skin or should you sew on the fox's patch? You know, that, that would be the, the wily thing. And so Isaiah Bolin writes this great analysis of what Machiavelli does. And he says that when you boil it down, you've always got two competing ideas, two competing schools trying to fight over some contested bit of ground or, or some you know, nation or whatever the case may be. And neither of them's right. There's no idealism. It's purely realism. And it's not competing ideals as to who wins this fight. The right side doesn't win. The side that wins is the side that you know, has the strategic factors on its side. As Sun Tzu would say, you need to have the strategic factors on your side. So Sun Tzu discusses what the strategic factors are. So does Machiavelli. They talk about what you should do as a sovereign, what you should do as a general. Sovereign's the king. General's the implementer of policy. What they say is, first of all, you have to be aware of what you're doing. You have to be sort of self-aware, you have to be aware of the territory, you have to understand the game that you're playing and who you are, what your skills are, what your capabilities are, what your weaknesses are in playing this game. And then you need these qualities for survival. That's the first thing that you're looking for. And what are the qualities of survival? That's a really funny thing. When you go back and read Sun Tzu, he talks about this, one of the very first things he talks about, you need harmony. And so I sort of, I've read that a dozen times and not really ever thought about that at all. But then John Boyd, who's, he's the basis for Maverick in Top Gun. 
but he he was a fighter pilot in Korea, and then he's a sort of military philosopher. And they say that he's he's America's foremost military thinker. He's the greatest sort of military philosopher since Sun Tzu, which is saying something because Sun Tzu is two and a half thousand years old. And he goes through and he does this analysis of Sun Tzu, and he says. Boyd is the one who developed the OODA loop, O-O-D-A, observe, orient, decide, act. But it, more than that, he's developed this sort of theory where he says, he also focuses on this idea of harmony, where he says you have to, harmony is the way that you get the people to follow the sovereign into achieving something. So it's a lot about principal agent, which is a big problem in investing. It's a big problem in industry, principal agent problems. And you think about the events that have harmonized or unified the US. So the US didn't want to enter into World War II, Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor, that unifies America into, into confronting that problem. There are lots of these sort of catalytic events that harmonize the people to achieving great things. And you think about what Buffett has done at Berkshire. He talks about this sort of stuff all the time. He doesn't, you know, he's not abrasive like Icahn is. Buffett's got a totally different approach and it allows Buffett to sort of, but then nobody would dispute that Buffett isn't a very shrewd, hard-nosed negotiator. He knows what he's doing, but he's doing it in a way that he's not inspiring attack from anybody. You know, he's he's looking for harmony. And so I'm, I, I'm not finished the book. I'm, I'm working my way through it at the moment. But I look at these qualities that he has in his business and what he looks for in his investments. And then I think about how I could search for those in my own investments and the way that I could construct my own my own business. And I can see a lot of parallels. And it's been a sort of revelatory to me to sort of think in these terms because it makes some investments that had probably been marginal for me. That's a clear no. I know it's, it's helped me to understand why other people do certain things that I would sort of not want to do. And then I understand why they're looking for something. And I've added this additional element of like harmony or something like that. And all of a sudden, so you think about, I, I talked about Shopify before and Shopify and Amazon are two great competitors now. I would much rather, you know, valuations aside and size sort of aside, I think that Shopify's business is sort of this incredible, potentially invincible business because what they do is they provide to lots and lots of different store owners. They just provide the back-end services to those store owners. So if any given store doesn't survive, Shopify doesn't care. They've got this portfolio approach to it. Amazon is sort of the store. If you have some bad experiences with Amazon, and that's increasingly the case. You get knockoffs through Amazon or they do something wrong. That might start clouding your mental picture as a consumer of Amazon. You might want to buy. You might say, well, I'm going to go to Walmart now. I'm going to go to Target now. I'm not going to buy all of my stuff from Amazon. I'm going to keep everybody else alive. Whereas with Shopify, you never really get that thought because you're never dealing directly with Shopify. You're dealing with all these other stores. So they have what Boyd would call variety. They have rapidity. So Boyd says there are four qualities. You need variety, rapidity, harmony, and initiative. And so when I look at these things, and it just it's just an additional way of me, a way for me to examine the strategies of these businesses and to see whether they possess these qualities of survival, you know, through to invincibility. And then I'm just looking for another dimension to the investing. And so that's what it achieves for me. And that's what the book is trying to explain this process. As I say, I'm right in the middle of writing it. I'm, I'm tangled up and trying to find my way out of the, the Gordian knot that I've created. But that, my hope is that I'll get to this point where it is cohesive and it makes a little bit of sense. Well, put me down for a copy. And, and, <laughs> I, will. And I expect it to be signed. <laughs> you can't find them not signed. Yeah, last question for you. Pandemic seems to be hopefully coming to a close here. I know living in LA, when I was last there, things had gotten locked down again, but vaccine rollouts are proceeding fairly smoothly. What are you most looking forward to on the other side? Well, I want the kids, you know, I've got three kids and they're, my daughter, it kills my daughter not being able to go and see her friends. Like her big request is, can I have people over at my birthday party? So that would be one of the first things that we'll look to do. I'm going to go back and catch up with everybody in person. We're going to go and have lunch, you and I, somewhere in the world, go and have a beer and have a chat, see what's happened. I want to get back out there and, and talk to people. Like the lockdown, is, to the extent that it's served any purpose, has now served its purpose and we need, to, we need to reopen and get back out there. Well, buddy, always great chatting with you. Thank you so much for joining me. Likewise, Corey, always the best questions. Thanks for having me. 
If you're enjoying the season, please consider heading over to your favorite podcast platform and leaving us a rating or review and sharing us with friends or on social media. It helps new people find us and helps us grow. Finally, if you'd like to learn more about newfound research, our investment mandates, mutual funds, or associated ETFs, please visit thinknewfound.com. And now, welcome back to my ongoing conversation with Harley Bassman. As a fun bit of history trivia for our listeners, our first interaction was actually about, I think, two years ago when I emailed you asking to join your mailing list. And as I recall it, I'll admit I didn't have the courage to go back and look at the emails. But as I recall it, I received from you a pretty pointed critique of some of the things I had written in my research blog, which I'm going to just paint over by saying it was a misunderstanding between us. But as I recall it, the critique was mostly centered around the use of sharp ratios. And I've noticed that as a theme in your writing as well, that you find the concept, for lack of a better word, repulsive. Why are you so against sharp ratios? Let's be clear. I did not call you personally repulsive, although that did occur to me at the time. Sharp ratios is one of those hot buttons for me because it's a marketing tool. It is not an investment tool. Now, when it was created, and you're only talking going back to some of the macro asset allocation ideas. I forgot what professor it is who did this. Markowitz. He was right in the grand scheme of looking at equities versus bonds, versus currencies, that made sense. But taking this macro idea and then putting it into a micro framework is just foolishness. Because what you're using as your measure of risk is daily realized volatility. Why is that a measure of risk? The fact that something has a small bid offer versus a big bid offer means that it's going to change the eventual outcome of the asset a year from now? I don't think so. Okay. What you care about is I buy something today. Where is it going to be in a year or two years or five years? And if it gets there by wiggling up and down a penny a day or five cents a day, doesn't make a difference to me. And this leads into this idea of reliance upon sharp ratio as a marketing tool, then leads to risk management processes, processes where people look at your sharp and they allocate capital or risk for whatever you're doing. And this encourages people. I mean, if you put the carrot left, people go left. You put the carrot right, people go right. I've been at firms that are very sharp ratio driven. What this does is it encourages you to go find very liquid, low volatility assets and then lever them up three, four, five to one, as opposed to buying some less liquid asset and sizing it properly and carrying that to to maturation. I think it's a dangerous tool because Not only is it not described risk properly, it encourages you to add excess leverage. At the end of the day, you almost always see negative convexity and excess leverage at the scene of the crime. 